Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Aldebandi. I'm one of the co-founders of the New Mexico Healthy Soil Working Group here with my colleagues. Um, about to um, introduce uh, our speaker for Soil Stories this evening. Um, this is a series we started several months ago to kind of highlight um, different folks in the in the soil uh, health space. Um, so I am going to turn this over to uh, to Jeff Goble now, um, who will be introducing Brent. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to uh, introduce Brent. I've known him for oh five years or four years, something like that, and. Um, um, I have a real passion about the concept the soil and water conservation district movement in this country. I think it's one of the best structures of government that we have. And Brent um, is uh, currently, he's the, um, oh, let's see, I've got that right here. He is, his title is Government Affairs Director for the New Mexico Association of Conservation Districts. He's also served as past president of the National Association of Conservation Districts, which is pretty impressive and was, you know, very good for New Mexico. Um, what I uh, would like to say as far as soil health is that Brent and Debbie Hughes and uh, Jim Berlier, um, you know, they were up there in that, um, in all those meetings, committee meetings and, and talking to legislatures to get this legislation passed. I mean, they were working as hard of it, at it as we were. It was just incredible. And Brent was just there all the time. And I just really am thankful and appreciate appreciative of, of, of his background. And he um, is in agriculture, he does work. And so he's been very committed to taking care of soil and health, soil health and and water and all that sort of thing for the state of New Mexico and his area down there where he lives. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brent, but thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Well, thank you, Jeff. And it is a privilege and an honor to be with you all. Um, and as I look at the list of people that are on, uh, a lot of friends out there. So I appreciate you being on also this evening. So when I was asked to present tonight for the soil health, um, you know, I, I was trying to think, well, what, what can I tell the people that are advocates of soil health that they don't always know? And, and I think that it came back to my story and because uh, it's, very, it's not a traditional health story, but it's one that I think represents where I live, and that's southeastern New Mexico. So, Isabel, if you want to put that first slide up, I'll start. So, the the picture you're looking at is um, the the picture on the right is a dust storm in Clayton, New Mexico, in 1928. And that's basically why I'm here today. And I was born in Springer, New Mexico, which was 90 miles due west of the epicenter of Cimarron County, Oklahoma, where the Dust Bowl really, that was the heart of the Dust Bowl. And in the 70s, the early 70s when I was in high school, my FFA teacher would take us out on the weekend it was all boys, girls weren't in FFA, and we would clean equipment out of fence rows and turn rows between Springer and Clayton. So, you know, finally I, I had to go ask my ag teacher, why is all this sand and dirt on these fences? And he said, well, it's, it's remnants of the Dust Bowl. And he, and he got to telling us the story of the Dust Bowl and and why it happened. And right then it tweaked my interest. I was raised on a cattle ranch uh, between Cimarron and Springer, where we really didn't have the, uh, the dust and, and the, uh, you know, the soil erosion that they had out east of Springer. So it was really interesting to me. And then I went to New Mexico State, got a degree in Ag Ed, and went to Texas Tech, got my master's. And then I was hired in 1979 as an ag teacher. And um, I knew I wanted to farm and ranch in 
wherever I made my home. And so about 2009, I think it was, I was sitting in my classroom. My wife and I had bought our first farm north of Hobbs, between Hobbs and Lovington. And I was, was teaching ag during the, the day, get off work, and then I'd farm at night. And we, we had irrigation, so we were planting alfalfa and, and traditional heavy tillage equipment because that's what everybody was doing. And then I think it was 2009, the, one of my former students came to the ag build and knocked on the door. And uh, of course I let him in, you're not gonna turn away a deputy sheriff. And he said, uh, Mr. Van Dyke, I, I, don't, I don't wanna scare you, but you're probably gonna hear that the sheriff's department is out at your, your farm. Um, and we, no big deal, you don't have a fire or anything but we're having to redirect traffic because the, the dirt blowing from your farm is so severe that it's unsafe for people to drive on the highway. And at that moment, I realized how embarrassing that was that the guy who's supposed to be teaching the youth of Lee County about production agriculture is having to be humiliated because they're shutting down the highway because my farm is blowing away. And it brought back memories of the early 70s when I was in Gladstone and Farley, New Mexico, east of Springer, cleaning out uh, fence rows and equipment out of fence rows. And I realized right then that there was a problem in the way that I was farming. And so I inquired with my local soil and water conservation district. And uh, they said, would, would welcome your input. Why don't we just put you on the board? So I ran for my board position in 20, uh, I mean in 2002, got elected and the rest is really history. But, you know, realizing that I was not a good steward of the land was, um, I think, the defining moment when I realized that what stewardship really was. And as you can see on the bottom of that slide, it, it, you know, I've been blessed to be able to not only teach ag for 31 years, but work for the, the U.S. State Department, USAID, internationally. So I've been a contract agriculture consultant since 1995, uh, 10 or 11 different countries. I've traveled to almost 30 international countries. So I most definitely have been able to see um, agriculture from the, the, the most primitive conditions to what we have here in America. If you'll change the slide, Isabel, thank you. And so I, I think the key to sustainable agriculture, and especially, and I'm going to reference a lot to southeast New Mexico, because that's where we make our home, that's where we farm, that's where we ranch, that's where we bought our farms. And the key to this is soil health. How do we become sustainable? And how do we keep producing food and fiber? And from being the national president of soil and water conservation districts, representing 3,000 conservation districts and about 25,000 employees and supervisors. Looking from that 30,000 foot perspective, we have to be sustainable. And the reason for that is the whole world looks to America to be able to put food and fiber in the home of every person worldwide, because we do feed about 25% of the whole world and that that's a that that's a huge challenge and, and i'll talk a little more about my feelings about that but the point is we're we're gonna have to be better stewards and we are improving each and every day oh, change the slide please and so 
here in southeastern New Mexico, my wife and I, we raise cattle. We have registered Herford, commercial Angus. We have alfalfa. We have grain crops. And um, three years ago, I guess, we planted a vineyard. And um, we're, we're excited about that because we're making, we're harvesting our first grapes as we speak for wine. So we're excited about that. If you'll change, Isabel. But not only do we farm in southeastern New Mexico, my wife and I have other agricultural interests internationally. And this has been a big part of who I am. We, um, we have a ranch in Ahasike, Georgia, which is southern Russia, uh, used to be southern Russia, in the, the Caucasus Mountains. And so I have a partner. The middle picture uh, is my partner, Yuri, and we flush embryos and hobs. I take them overseas. We put them in Russian cows. And so we have Herefords uh, and Black Baldies in uh, Sasha or Ahasike, Georgia. And it's, we've been in that operation about 10 years. About seven years we've been in a, in a pork production facility in Gori. Uh, that's the hometown of Joseph Stalin. And um, the picture with the, the young man standing by the pork carcass is my other partner. And the reason I, I bring up the Georgia influence is because when I start traveling to Georgia, and I travel there every year, sometimes twice a year, even three times a year, but what I've seen is a society that's been able to feed itself for over a thousand years, and they've done it using what we consider soil health principles, but to them, it's just taking care of the land, you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. Change the slide, please. And so one of the things we did um, in Hobbs on our farm was, um, and it was through an, another one of those embarrassing moments. I was uh, at a national meeting, I was in Minneapolis, and um, the uh, head of NRCS, was Jason Weller at the time. And he asked me, um, when did you get your conservation plan? And I said, oh, I, I haven't had one. And so our state conservation has got a phone call from Jason saying, how can the national president um, not have a conservation plan? So within about a month, we had a conservation plan and our, our state conservationist, Javier Montoya, sent uh, a training group down to Hobbs and they spent two days on our farm. And so I probably had the most complete up-to-date conservation plan in New Mexico. Uh, talk about overkill, I got it. But what we did was we understood from our conservation plan the benefits of soil health. And one of the biggest benefits of my wife and I have noticed is our ability to, to do a better job grazing cattle. And so the picture that you'll see on the left is we have an improved hybrid Bermuda that is irrigated and we're able to not only graze it, but we're able to for winter feeding. And the middle picture there is one of our registered Herford with an embryo calf. And the, the bottom picture is the picture, I hope you can see it, that's really, really important. The far right of that picture is a pivot that no longer has And so it's brown and there's not a thing growing on it because we haven't had any rain in five months. The, the, the next section you can see with the little black dots out there, that's um, a rotational plot that we're putting cows on. We can, we can put cows on those rotational plots for about 10 days and then we move them. And to the far left is our improved irrigated pasture. So what we do is we're able to irrigate, 
uh, graze it. We come back with the flail and we mound the fecal material and then just keep rotating. The amazing thing is here, we put the, our embryo recept cows on this 25 acres about five months ago. And so we're running about a cow calf unit per acre for the last five months on this rotational modified savory um, system. If you change it, Isabel. And I think this is the, 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 the best picture of all that I have. And I uh, flew my drone over one of the paddocks yesterday to get this picture. And the really, really green spots, uh, some of you will recognize because that's where the fecal material was flailed and we irrigated. Have you lost? Am I still on? You can hear me? Okay. And so that's the perfect picture of what good soil health principles is all about. That fecal material being irrigated is able to fertilize and we grow grass. Change the picture. And another thing that we do through our conservation plan is we're doing strip farming and the picture on the left is hay grazer. So we leave strips of the hay grazer for wildlife. Um, the rest we harvest and we bale it and use it for winter feed. But we're trying to, to keep some of that moisture in the soil. And, and, and not only that, but we're finding out that that's excellent to protect our baby calves when it's 106 degrees, you know, 10 days in a row, they don't do well with that kind of heat, but they can find shade in that row cropping. The, another thing that we've done is we, because of our conservation plan, it recommended that we transition from like flood irrigation and side row irrigation to uh, to center pivot and to drip irrigation. So we planted a vineyard and um, it's been tremendously successful and we are harvesting our first production grapes, like I said, as we speak. Next slide. I'm watching the clock and I better hurry. So um, how do we encourage not only Southeastern New Mexico and all of New Mexico and the nation to look at uh, soil health principles and best management practices. Well, right now there's a bill in uh, Washington, D.C., Senate Bill 3894, and it's called the Growing Climate Solutions Act of 2020. And what it does is it addresses no-till, reduced-till, minimum-till, carbon storage, row crops, and rotational grazing. And I think the key, I really do, I think the key to this is the carbon credit exchange that's in there. And we all probably have heard about the carbon exchange, probably 12 years now, there's been an international carbon exchange and, and you could buy a ton of carbon for $2 a ton. The problem is it's very, very low. And so this new SB 3894 is trying to rectify that. So they have got a matrix now of um, what it's going to take to verify uh, carbon storage. And once we can verify carbon storage and we can get certified individuals to go out and verify that, I think more and more people will invest in those carbon credits and agriculture, production agriculture will most definitely benefit from that. So we need to know who's gonna verify it, what are they verifying, what is that model? And one group that's really working hard is the Noble Foundation out of Oklahoma on doing that what component where 
of course, is anywhere in America that will benefit from that? And how do we do it? If you'll change the slide, Isabel. This is how we do it. And um, I, I have a friend who's now the national president of soil and water from Des Moines, Iowa. And they've been doing soil health and minimum till for years. And they get 40 inches of rain a year. The pictures I'm showing you there are on the left is what we can do with moisture. And on the right, that's the, the pasture adjacent to my farm with no rain this year. And so if you don't have green, you don't have carbon sequestration. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out how to turn brown to green. Um, I don't have that, ma that magic wand to do that. So we're going to have to rely on science to do that. And I know my next slide might be controversial, but I'll explain it anyway. Isabel? So in southeastern New Mexico, one of the things that everybody is working on is oil produced water. So during um, the production of oil, uh, for every gallon of oil produced, you get five gallons of oil water. It's oil produced water. This is the, the this product. If you were to drink it in its uh, natural state, would kill you because it does kill cattle. So we're not advocating ever advocating putting on oil produced water in its raw form on the ground. The picture I'm showing you is a friend of mine. I go to church with him. This is his um, pet project, his name is Donnie Hill, and he has a oil production facility that disposes of produced water, you know, thousands of feet underground. Just in Lee County, New Mexico, only in my county, we produce a million barrels or 42 million gallons of produced water every day. He has found through his technology that he can turn oil field produced water, the picture on the left that's black, because that's what it looks like after oil has been separated, to a product which is in the next bottle that is extremely transparent. I still wouldn't drink this because it's, it's got some additives in there that you don't want to drink. But we can, we can remove those things like uh, fluorides and we can remove the arsenic and we can remove the hydrocarbons, we can remove the salt. Once that's done, I think that it would be safe at that point as long as it meets EPA standards to turn those dark brown droughty prairies into grass that can sequester carbon. And, and maybe, you know, all field produced water is not the answer, but it's the only one that I know of, except for cloud seeding, that might be able to rectify the problem that we have in southeastern New Mexico. Next slide. So in southeastern New Mexico, just to give you I remember somebody on one of these programs was talking about New Mexico can't feed itself. I, I think we can, because I, I looked at the data today for Lee County, and this is only Lee County. And the average farm in Lee County is almost 3,500 acres. So the other panelists that have been on this program have been very small. Um, compared to almost 3,500 acre farms. But what can you do with 3,000 acre farms is you can bring the cost of production down, especially if you use soil health. And um, just in my county, we produce 16,000 acres of cotton, 11,000 acres of hay, 10,000 acres of corn, 3,000 acres of peanuts, etc. 
25 dairy cows. And I'm going to talk about the dairy cows in just a second because I've got four minutes. And then about 60,000 head of beef cattle. Change the slide. Now, this is only my county. So if we converted all of those acres to dairy beef and, and human consumable products, we could feed 758,000 people just from our county. Isabel, change the slide. Is there another one? Are there no more? It's the end of the slideshow. Well, I must not have added all of them. So what we did is we did, that's okay. We looked at the number of produced oil field water gallons per day in, in Lee County. If we could convert those oil field produced bad waters into good waters for agriculture, that would sustain 20,000 more dairy cows just in our county. It take, we, could, we could put into production 126 center pivots just from that wastewater. And I'm not saying or advocating that we do that. I would like to see us shut down the draw on the Ogallala and used oil field produced water or something like that to continue to support the dairy industry because the dairy industry is it's huge to Lee County. We're the fourth largest county in New Mexico in milk production. We can produce about 70 pounds per cow per day if we have the water. And so the water is the key. So basically I, I'm looking at the clock and I'm about out of time. We do have time for questions. I'll turn it over to Rob or Isabel or Christina or Jeff. So if anyone has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, you'll see the chat uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I, I was just gonna say thank you, Brent, so much for your wonderful presentation. And it was fascinating to hear the story, uh, you know, all the way dating back to the influence of the Dust Bowl and the incident that happened with the sheriff and, uh, you know, learning from your experience. And, and I, I found it really exciting to learn about your background. And I'm sorry I haven't asked you your story. So I'm so excited you've been on Soil Stories now so I could hear a little bit of it and look forward to talk to you more about it. But one quick question I was wondering, given your experience with the National Association of Conservation Districts and in New Mexico, um, what do you think you you attribute the success of that organization dating back to the Dust Bowl and how could that organization, what are the lessons of that organization that could be helpful in advancing soil health here in New Mexico and in general? Well, Rob, thank you very much for that question. And, and it is, um, when I got involved in soil and water conservation, the, the one thing I didn't do was think that I'd ever be on the, in, nationally as a national president. But it opened up doors and, and it, it opened up the opportunity to see that uh, the United States is a big country. And the, you know, soil health principles from one state to another vary. And so we have to be extremely flexible. Um, as an example, I, you know, I, I'm a, an advocate of soil health and to be a good steward of the land. But I understand why my farmer neighbors to the east of me in West Texas are hesitant to adopt soil health principles because using minimum till or no till on dry land cotton, the best production records that, that I've heard of to the east of me is two bales per acre. Whereas conventional till, they're getting four and five bales of cotton per acre. Um, maybe the difference is patience. And soil health principles and, and the advantage to soil health sometimes takes four, five, 
10 years to really see the benefits. And for a farmer who spent $750,000 on a new uh, John Deere cotton picker, it's hard to tell them that uh, be patient because they have that bill to pay. And, and it's because they're willing to go to the bank, borrow the money and take that risk that we can buy Levi's for $25 a pair. So I appreciate their risk. I appreciate their passion. And I definitely understand it's not something that's going to happen overnight. We have to just be better at educating. And, and it's even, you know, my wife and I put our corners of one of our pits into total no-till. And we've, you know, but we just haven't had enough moisture to really generate any. The only thing growing out there is things that uh, you know, are invasives. They're um, ground cherries and, and uh, silver leaf nightshade and uh, broom snakeweed. These are things that are invasive species. We don't want them, but they're the only thing growing when you don't get any moisture. So from a national perspective, and, and real quickly, let me, I, I think one of the neatest stories I have from being a national president is I flew to Iowa, I did their convention, they took me out on a tour, and they kept talking about tiles. They said, well, this farm was tiled in 1945, this farm was tiled in 1960. And when you say tile, to a New Mexican, you think a beautiful sautilla tile that I find in Santa Fe in the apartment that I rent. Um, so I was looking for Mexican tile out on these farms. And finally on the third farm, I, I told Tim, I said, Tim, I, you know, I plead my ignorance. I don't see one darn tile out here. And he said, well, it's that black pipe right there. And I said, well, why didn't you call it black pipe instead of tile? So, um, you know, it, it depends on where you're from. They fight each and every day in Iowa to get water off the land. And in New Mexico, we fight every day to get water on the land. So there's not one model that fits everybody. But I think the one thing we have to remember is we're going to have to feed 9 billion people eventually. And we're going to have to do it with less resources. And we're going to have to be better stewards. We're going to have to be better farmers. We're going to have to use science to be able to do that. Because I guarantee you, I've been to countries like Turkey and Azerbaijan, where I assure you, before a, a father will let their child starve to death, they will go to whatever extent they can to feed their, their children. And, and I sympathize with that. And so we have to realize that as, as an American culture, we have to be aware of that situation. If we cannot feed our own population, we don't have security as a nation. And from a Christian perspective, I believe it's my job to help feed those. I don't care where they're from, they cannot feed themselves. And so if it's a child in Africa that's hungry, I don't want any child, no matter where, to go hungry. So we just have to be better stewards, better farmers, and more productive. That was a long answer, Rob, to a short question. No, it's fantastic. Uh, thank you for all your thoughts. I, I didn't want to take up all the question time either, because I know there are a lot of people on the call. Um, and I we really welcome folks to make a question in the chat room. In fact, I I haven't been, my internet has been a little unstable, so I might have been out of commission on the phone listening to you while the computer wasn't on, and so I might have missed a lot of the chats. But uh, um, is there a question from Amy Larson that want, if you want to ask in person? I see. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and I, I appreciate Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up? Yes. Okay, great. Um, oh, sorry, here. Hello. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your, your stories and I think it's really important to share, um, everybody share 
stories, especially, you know, any that pertain to New Mexico. And um, so I, I really appreciated that. Um, I was curious, you know, thinking at a larger scale is so different from smaller scale, you know, soil health issues. And so I was curious if you can share, number one, what are the key soil health strategies when you're thinking about large scale farming and ranching? Um, and then kind of secondarily, how do you measure soil health pro progress when you're working at that scale? What, what kinds of frameworks or um, uh, what, yeah, how do you measure it at large so scale? Amy, that's a that that's a wonderful question, and so um, there there's no matrix for measuring it uh, exactly. So what you know, the bottom line is at the end of the year when we walk into our bankers and say this is what we generated to pay on our debt, because I assure you the majority of people around me and my neighbors and the other farmers here. Um, have a have a major investment in their operations and the margin of profit is very very small so it comes down to economics and that's why it's been really really hard to convince cotton farmers especially dryland cotton farmers um, to embrace some of the soil health principles because right now with cheap fuel um, you can run a tractor in, in a field um, many times um, economically because our fuel costs are really low. And the bottom line again is, we've, you know, we have to make those payments on those $100,000 tractors and almost million dollar cotton strippers. And we were looking at a, at a no-till drill um, the other day, $75,000. I mean, so when you get large scale farming, you have large scale debt. And I assure you that the, the farmer in Corrales that lays awake at night, wondering if they're, they're gonna be able to harvest their next cutting of hay, I have those same sleepless nights. Um, right now, the birds are eating my grapes. And so whatever it is, if you're in agriculture, it's a risk. But we do it because we believe in what we're doing. We, we do it because we want to help feed those that can't feed themselves. I never became a farmer uh, thinking I'd ever get rich. And that I don't think that will ever happen um, because it just seems like I just get a bigger debt load every year. But, but I love what I do. I love the ability to go out and um, to farm. Thank you, Amy, for that question and, and Brent for your response. And I'm gonna turn it over to Christina because she saw questions that I didn't see when my internet was down. And we wanna make sure everyone has a chance. So uh, please let me pass it to Christina to ask the remaining questions, which there are many. Okay, um, so Mark, up to you. Um, ask your question, please. I just wondered if you had written a book. All these things are fascinating. I'd like to read it somewhere of all the things that you've learned. Um, I have not, have not written a book. Uh, never planned on writing a book, but I, but I assure you, um, I thought about it once. I was in um, a village in the country of Georgia before I invested in a ranch over there, and I was at a livestock auction and um, I was watching people purchase. It's not an auction that's typical like New Mexico or America. It was more of a barter system. But anyway, they bought. Brent, we've lost you. Oh, and I'm sorry about that. I, I live out in the country, so my connection's really <clears throat> poor, but I don't know where it dropped on my, my comment, but I was in Georgia at an auction. They bought uh, an animal and led him to the river and they processed him and put all the byproducts in the stream. And I thought, 
at that point, I am so blessed to live in America because we have rules and regulations against that. And um, so I, I felt really blessed to be an American at that point. But then I also realized the culture involved. And, um, you know, we in America are very productive. We're very educated. Um, and it's, it's just a really big world out there. And so once we fix our soil health and our agriculture is in America, the work's not over because we have a lot more to do. Okay. Um, thank you, Brent. Anna, would you like to unmute up and ask your question? Hi, thank you. Um, so, so I guess mine kind of go together. I was wondering if um, there in New Mexico, any of the local universities, if there are soil health extension workers that are in the school system in their own fields or with the farmers and ranchers in the area, if they're working together to conduct research or to introduce any of the soil health practices um, to help maybe alleviate some of the costs or um, the stress of the ranchers and farmers from um, basically its exper experiments. So I was wondering if, if there's any of those relationships happening. Oh, I, I just love to answer that question because we are again blessed to be in New Mexico. We have an amazing state university um, and, and including Eastern New Mexico University that have expertise and they are absolutely working every day to improve production agriculture in New Mexico. When you add in our extension service, when you add in the um, other entities like, uh, you know, the 501c3s like the Farm Bureau and cattle growers that are working every day to improve production of food and fiber in New Mexico, we're totally blessed. We have great leadership at NMDA that is connecting the dots. They're working with, with the extension service, they're working with conservation districts. And first and foremost is the, extent, is the um, soil and water district. We have 47 soil and water districts in New Mexico. Every county has at least one office and those are volunteers that believe in good stewardship. And so they are that, that middle person that's working with the universities and working with the National Association and transferring that information to local producers with the help of NMDA and all the other partners that we have out there. And NRCS is an amazing partner. So they make sure we're, we're co-housed most of the time with NRCS. So the dissemination of information happens extremely quickly. So I think we're, we're blessed to have that networking system, not only in New Mexico, but in America that we have, because we can get that information out quicker than any other country in the world. And, and that's a fact. With that wonderful network that you have there in New Mexico, have they been able to help any of the ranchers or farmers introduce um, trees, such as silvo pasture, putting the trees into the pasture land with the cows, or maybe cover crops that are more endurant uh, for the lack of moisture and water? Uh, great question, Anna. The uh, cover crops, I, I think, are the easiest sell uh, in New Mexico because we are a high desert state. We got to always remember, New Mexico is a desert state. We're a high desert state. But I think that, that every farmer or the vast majority of farmers understand the value in cover crops. So cover crops was an easy sell uh, in New Mexico and has been for the last 20 years. I, I can't think of anybody that farms around me and we have extremely large farms, but I don't know anyone that doesn't use cover crops. So that was an easy sell. When we get into minimum till or no till, it's a little more challenging because of lack of moisture. If you have moisture, if you have irrigation, um, 
we we can move that that bar over quicker into building that um, that healthy soil component. But when you when you get four or five inches of rain a year, it just takes a lot longer, and you have to be patient. Most of my bankers have not been very patient. Okay. Thank you for those questions, Anna. Uh, Natalie, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to uh, see if you could repeat how many um, oil produced water gallons uh, you said were, were being um, put out every day in Lee County. How many gallons was that? Did you say 42 so million, million gallons? Million barrel. Oh, okay. So just in Lee County, and I don't know if you're from New Mexico, Natalie, or not, but just in Lee County, um, you know, average, we're doing about a million barrels a day of produced water. That's 42 million gallons. And it's, as most people know, the United States now is the number one oil producing country in the world. And Lee County, New Mexico is the number one oil producing county. So we're an agriculture oil county. So you're, you're either involved in, in production oil or production agriculture, um, which, which makes, uh, that helps our state budget if prices of oil are good. But uh, that's a lot of water. So 42 million, gallons a day uh, just the permian basin just the permian basin we're hitting almost a billion gallons of produced water a day um, that we have to dispose of some way and i hate to see it sent seven thousand feet underground to to never surface again uh, if if we have the technology and the science to clean it where it's safe for ag production and I'm not advocating drinking it, although my soil and water district in 2003 did a, a process where we did um, a pre-cleaning of produced water and then did RO. And at the end of the process, all the board drank it. So it met EPA drinking standards, we drank it. And so I, right then I knew if it was safe enough for me to drink, it's definitely safe enough for me to grow grass, native grass, and sequester carbon. All right, thank you. A follow on to that um, from Regenitarianism. Have, have you, um, are you still here? Shall I ask the question? It looks like he's gone, or she. Um, the question was how expensive is the process of cleaning the the produced water and uh, do we know anything about what it uh, in, impacts it has on the soil microbiology so um another great question so the hydrocarbons is uh, is the the biggest challenge and the salts getting out when when you're talking about uh produced water that's heavy and salt you've got a lot of salt you might have you know 10 pound brine 15 pound brine um, so what do you do first and foremost with all that salt you've got to find something to do with that salt once it's been removed and then the other parts of the cleaning process is the technology is there today we can we can remove arsenic and and pinpoint the arsenic remove it from that waste stream and market it as, as uh, you know a product that is commercially available to sell. We can we can take some of the metals out of there, you know, whether it's carpet or copper or whatever it is. There is value in that. There are some studies going on now that that are pointing to the fact that there's enough uh, precious uh, metals in produced water that we might be able to pay for the cleaning process. Because right now the cleaning of that, that water uh, is more expensive than, than downhole disposal. We've got to balance that where it's, it's 
cost effective to clean it. And we can do that. And when we look at uh, countries like Israel, you know, Israel is, is um, taking their gray water and recycling it through a human seven times. You know, if they can do it, and they've been doing it for years, that technology is there, but we want to make sure it's safe. I want to make sure I'm not contaminating, you know, my, my farm. I want my children to be able to inherit it. So I want to make sure that it is safe. But if, if we can verify that it's safe, then I'm all for it. Okay, I think um, Jeff had uh, something he wanted to add, and then I have a question um, beyond that. So just real quick, um, David, Dr. David Johnson, who's a soil microbiologist at NMSU, um, it's interesting, he says, uh, there's two things. One, he says that there's lots of species of you know, my, microbiology that do different jobs, and they can break down some things, and manage some things in the soil. So that's interesting in terms of that. Also, um, you know, uh, David talks about that water in, you know, is the limiting factor for growth, just like you've talked about, Brent. Um, and so that's, that's interesting about the possibility that soil microbes could manage the, um, the um, you know, the, the, the any toxicity or whatever that's in the, in the water and then water, of course, being that limiting factor for, for growing life, including soil microbiology. So that, that's interesting to think about that. You know, uh, there's one other piece on that. The city of Albuquerque, the, what's coming out of the sewage uh, facility into the Rio Grande is, is amazing in terms of um, the pharmaceuticals, the pesticides, uh, it's 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 scary what's coming there, and of course our irrigation water where, down where I live comes almost directly out of that, uh, you know, the effluent of Albuquerque, especially on a dry year like this, and gets circulated all the farmlands across here. So, but it, I have a friend in Texas who has a ranch who's turned it into wetlands, and they clean the water of Dallas. Um, and then recycle that back up about 47 miles back up stream um, in an 84 inch pipe. And it's allowed uh, the population of Dallas to go from 1.2 million to 1.9 million. So I wonder if it's possible if wetlands, the, the biology and wetlands, the biology and soils can uh, take care of some of that stuff. So it's just a comment or a thought that you triggered. So thank you. Oh. Jeff, absolutely. I, I, you know, um, the creation of the soil was amazing because it can, it can do so much when we think about the model in Israel where they're using, they're pumping affluents out onto the deserts and then letting the sand filter those affluents and then they're pulling the affluents, uh, gray waters back out and, and blending it and, and, putting back into household. Uh, when I, there's a book called Let There Be Water and, and it's um, about the Israel model. Uh, it's amazing, it, it's a great read because it's amazing what the, the land can do and the soil can do. But uh, I was on a groundwater panel last week, a national groundwater panel uh, with Secretary of the Environment Department and others and um, one a person asked me, so if they license produced water to be used for, for animal crops or, or any crops, shouldn't there be a label on there saying what's in that produced water? Mm -hmm. and, and I said, I'm happy to, to label it as oil field produced water, you know, if that day ever comes but only if everybody else that I'm having to compete in that market share for also labels what's in theirs. Because I have been all over the world. I've seen avocados fertilized with human fecal material. So if they want to put on their avocado package that it was fertilized with human waste, I'm more than happy to put on my label that uh, my wheat was fertilized or watered 
with produced water that's been claimed. So as long as the, pl the, the playing field is level for all producers, I, I don't have a problem doing that because I really believe that we can make it safe for, for the consumer. I don't have a problem eating it. I didn't have a problem drinking produced water. Nice. Thank you, Brent. Um, I think I'll take the last question and then we'll, um, or I ask the last question and add, hand it off to Isabel. Um, and that is this. Um, Brent, would you uh, give us, uh, give everyone some advice about how they might engage with their local soil and water conservation district? Um, Absolutely. We, we have an amazing uh, 47 districts in New Mexico. Um, I think being a national president, I realized there's not one thing that everybody does. Everybody, every conservation district nationally addresses their local conservation need. Um, I, I see Lynn on the, his picture there. When, when I think of Lynn Montgomery and the Coronado Soil and Water District, I think of their, their containment structures that prevent floods from flooding the soil or the town of Bernalillo. That's a unique call to arms that they're doing. They, they provide that unique um, you know, infrastructure for the protection of their community. Whereas my soil and water district we're all about finding new sources, mining new water, so that we can continue to produce food and fiber for generations to come. So every county in New Mexico has a conservation district. They're usually housed with USDA, uh, NRCS, um, FSA building. And um, it's, a, it's a phone call away. And they, anybody could, well, outside of COVID, but you could just walk in and introduce yourself and say, how can you help me? And, and those managers within those offices or the local board, they can point you in the right direction. So it's a free service. We don't charge anybody uh, anywhere in America for those, those kinds of questions or those services. Now, if there's something like uh, going out and performing a function. There might be a, a, a small feed um, to that, but I'll tell you what, the, the districts, I'm so proud of them. Uh, the San Juan district in, in Farmington, Aztec, Bernalillo, I, I think they're administering like $3 million worth of grants to improve their community and their bunch of volunteers. So they're just example after example not only in New Mexico, but nationwide, of what those 3,000 conservation districts are doing to help America produce food and fiber. Okay. All right. Um, we have a, a, one more question has appeared. Nancy, would you like to ask that? And then, then we need to close. It's getting on to 6.30. Yeah, sorry, I'm eating my dinner as, as I enjoy this fascinating conversation. I was just wondering, it, because of the price of oil uh, is, is now at a little less than $40 a barrel and is projected to be there for several years, and I, I believe that the margin for profit in a fracking operation would have to be, uh, the price would have to be at least 50 to 60 um, dollars per barrel couldn't we just use the the water that they're not using to for agriculture i mean directly without putting it in the ground and bringing it back out again if you, if you know what i'm saying i mean at least for now i don't know where they get that water but they get it from somewhere right they do and and a lot of it is agriculture water but the biggest user of the ogallala water is agriculture at about 90 percent so oil and gas, I've heard numbers from three to 5% of all water pumped in Lee County goes for oil and gas. So that's still a small percentage. So not cheap oil, not out there drilling is saving a little bit of water, but the new bill that passed the legislature 
uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, really tried to, to solve that with an incentive to use more and more oil field produced water in the reuse process to quit using fresh water. And it, it's helping, but I, I think that the, the um, elephant in the room is that million barrels a day just in Lee County that's being disposed of. Um, you know, we, the Ogallala is going dry and it produces about uh, a third of all the grain crops in America. It's the largest irrigation aquifer in the world and it's going dry. So when it goes dry, so does uh, shelves on, on supermarkets across America. So we have to work every day in trying to preserve that. Okay, Isabel. All right. Well, thank you everyone for these great questions and comments. And thank you Brent so much for being so generous to join us today in the middle of harvest. So we really appreciate that. And I personally enjoy this series so much because I get to learn things about people that I work with that I really didn't know, like why soil health, right? So it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Um, I want to um, just announce the next uh, speakers here. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to have these two young women with us next uh, month on August 18. So mark your calendars. Um, um, these are Emily Rasim and Don Gonzalez, and they're currently both working with the Asekia Association in youth and education. And they're also both farmers. Um, so um, they are farm trainers for the apprenticeship program Los Sembradores. Um, and Emily do, does a lot of work with uh, youth in schools, so really exciting work. Um, so really those two, Emily grew up in Tezuki and Don in Chamisal. Uh, so both in northern New Mexico, but in different cultures, and they really give me a lot of hope. Um, they are a great example for today's youth um, and young people um, that show a deep love and respect for each other and for each other's culture, uh, for elders and for tradition, and, and really for the earth that we all share. So I hope you will join us um, for that which I, I believe will be a really special uh, gathering. And it's the first time that we have two people. So that's what they wanted. It will be nice. Looking forward to joining with you all again. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.